All right, I think the, uh, the digital voice means that it's time that we officially uh, get going. Thank you all so much for coming to our editors roundtable. It is absolutely delightful to see so many of you. I wish I could see you all in person. Um, I'm used to, at this point in the conference, having people throwing jokes around it about me chasing people down in the halls to literally yell at them to submit stuff to me. Um, so I'll say that now. If you get nothing else from this roundtable, please do not hesitate to submit to our publications. Uh, and if you get nothing else beyond that from our roundtable, if you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, I think our hope in running this roundtable and running just about any editor's roundtable is, uh, first off, to demystify a bit of the process of editing uh, and publication and whatnot. Um, I'll turn this over very briefly, but just a, a quick story. When I was a grad student, for me, editors were terrifying non-entity folks who existed solely to judge my work and tell me if I was good enough to be in the field. Uh, and it turns out that when I finally reached out and talked to most of those people, they were surprisingly humans, just like us. Um, and it was wonderful to find that what at one point had been terrifying to me as a step, a hurdle that I had to cross in order to become published wasn't necessarily a hurdle I had to get through, but a resource for me to use in my own writing. If I had questions as I was writing something, I could write an editor and say, hey, is this work that I'm working on something that your journal would be interested in? And more often than not, the editors would write back and say, sure, but you'd need to do this to it. Or yeah, let's talk about how you might take that. And I think that some of what we want to do with this roundtable here is just give you a sense of who we are and how our journals work, how our publications work, um, and how we can serve you. So we'll start with some introductions and then I'll ask folks uh, to do some descriptions of their publications uh, or the, the aspects of their publication, such as the book review side. Um, and then in fairly short order, we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, so just introduction wise, um, if it wasn't obvious already, uh, my name is Derek Ross. Um, I'm professor and director of graduate studies at Auburn University. I'm the editor in chief of communication design quarterly. I'm also the co-director of our lab for usability, communication, interaction, and accessibility. Um, my main areas of research are environmental rhetoric, ethics, and document design. Um, and I am more than happy to talk with any of you in any digital format that you can teach me. Um, <laughs> some of you are laughing because I just figured out Slack like 15 minutes ago. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to any of you about my publication, which is obviously Communication Design Quarterly, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so maybe let's move on from there. Uh, Laura, do you want to introduce who you are next? Sure. Uh, my name is Laura Arducer, and I'm co-editor with Leanne Roik, whose last name I can never see, say. Um, we're co-editors of uh, Programmatic Perspectives. I'm at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I teach in the professional writing area. I'm the director of our professional writing program. And my research areas are in um, tech -com pedagogy and rhetoric of health and medicine. And, and just like Derek said, reach out to us. Excellent. So those are our two major publications being represented today, and, and we are very lucky in that we have our book review editors with us as well. Uh, Avery? Hi, everyone. I'm Avery Edenfield, Assistant Professor at Utah State University in Technical Communication and Rhetoric. Uh, my research interests are the ways that um, minoritized, marginalized communities use technical documents for self-advocacy. Um, and so I'm, yeah, I'm the book review editor right now for CDQ. So I'm happy to talk about that at any point. Excellent. Russell? I'm Russell Kirksey. I'm the assistant professor of technical and professional writing at Penn State Harrisburg and the director of the minor in technical and professional writing. And also the interim director of communication sciences and disorders if anybody wants to know about that um, and i am book review editor for programmatic perspectives and please feel free to email or uh, contact me in any other way you'd like uh, i'll be sure to work with you 
Thanks. Excellent. So I've got a series of prompts that will again start with. Um, let me see how we'd like to do this. Yeah, I think what we'll do is I don't want to make this, uh, as we've talked about in some other editorial roundtables, I don't want to make this a wall of editors talking at you. So maybe what we'll do is I'll take each prompt, let everybody, let each editor talk for a minute, and then open the floor to questions, and then I'll move through the prompts from there. So that this really should be an interactive discussion. We're here to help you. Um, probably the most often, the most prominent question I get, and I suspect that all of y'all get, is what kinds of articles does your journal publish? Um, communication design quarterly, uh, I, I often joke, uh, my wife jokes that uh, I'm in the business of pointing out the obvious. Um, communication design quarterly publishes quite obviously articles on communication design. Um, and one of the things that I'm striving to do as editor is pretty much leave it at that. We publish articles on communication design. If it relates to communication design in any way, shape, or form, we are interested in considering it. Um, personally, I'm super invested in articles that deal with social justice issues, issues of race, issues of inclusion, and very, very, very interested in publishing articles that push the bounds of communication design, that question current practices, that challenge current practices, that look at culture and communication, all of that to say though, that if you are working on something that remotely deals with how we design communication, we are a place that you should be considering for publication. Um, in this case, let me go from, from publication to publication. Um, Avery, can you talk a little bit about the sorts of book reviews we're interested in getting? Um, yeah, so um, we're looking for anything that's relevant to practitioners in the design of communication, teachers in the design of communication, and researchers. Um, so, and especially looking for reviews that can hit all three. Um, so we've been really excited the last, the last book review we've been working on this last cycle for the next year. Um, I had, I asked people to submit small proposals and got a lot of proposals for different books and was able to pick, uh, work with, work with uh, book reviewers who are experts on that topic. And so it's been really exciting to see people bringing their expertise to book reviews in that way. Cool, thanks. Laura, can you talk a little bit about what articles you publish? Sure. Um, we publish anything that has to do with programmatic issues um, for the field of technical, scientific, um, communication, professional communication. Um, so we publish twice a year and we're, we're interested in, we, we do research articles, but we also do program showcases. So those are um, a little bit more narrative based and more um, localized in terms of what people are doing at their individual institutions. Um, and as Russell will talk about, we do book reviews. We also do some commentaries um, and we're interested. We also do along with like, like programmatic from an administrative side, we do pedagogy articles. So anything along those lines, we've been thinking a lot about online learning, obviously. Um, we've got a couple of issues coming up next year. One will deal with social justice, another uh, about managing programs during times of crises. Um, but we're always, we also look for um, special issue editors. So we try to do a special issue maybe once a year, once every, once every couple years. Um, and we'll have people from outside of our editorial team to do, to work as editors for that. And we work with those people to develop the issue. So as well as looking for articles, we also look for special issue editors. Sure. And Russell, tell us a bit about the book reviews you do. Well, I think that the key to book reviews is the link argument to uh, adapt to the audience of program administrators and program directors that that there are a lot of fine books and I've, I've already been through this is just my first first uh, uh, couple of issues and it people will get down in the weeds of the review. 
uh, and do a good job with that, but not, not uh, need some prompting to work toward how that we should situate this particular review and, and the contents and, and, and what the suggestions are by the author and the reviewer to program administrators, program directors, and how the, those folks can use this information to either in the classroom or get to the, the people who need it the most. And so that we, with that said, we're open to most all possibilities for technical writing, technical communication, professional writing, uh, but we need to focus specifically on how it would affect a, a, a program. I think that that's important. Excellent, thanks. Um, so like I said, I've got a series of prompts, but I think let's pause there and, and open the floor to all of you. Um, we've talked a little bit about the kinds of articles that our journal publishes. We've got everything from teaching articles to in, in CDQ, we've got experience reports, general research articles. What questions do you have for us about things we might consider? Yeah, Gabriel. Yeah, hi. So I'm planning to propose, uh, write a proposal for the career advancement research grants. And I know it recommends or encourages like winners of those grants to publish in CDQ. And so I guess I'm asking how broadly defined is communication design? Because I want to work on this app that does translation and I want to see how to better that translation in that app. Does that kind of fall into the category? Yeah, or two? Absolutely. Um, again, I always laugh. I, pretty much as broadly as you want to define communication design is what we will consider. Now, what I often end up working with articles on is how to make sure that that move towards how this can inform communication design is made obvious to our readers. Because I think a lot of times when we're writing, we're thinking, obviously, to me, I'm talking about communication design, I'm thinking about pedagogical practices, I'm thinking about how this might inform industry, I'm thinking about how this might inform other research. But sometimes it gets hidden <laughs> under the paragraphs, right? Um, and so part of what I always often end up working with folks uh, on is making that explicit. In fact, I am a happy, happy editor when even if you've gone deep into theory or statistics that I will sometimes admit I haven't the, the foggiest idea of what you're talking about and I have to get other opinions on it, I'm a happy editor when it then comes back and says, and this specifically relates to how you might apply this in the field because it does X, Y, and Z. Or practitioners could take this and use this to inform their design practices by doing this. Or teachers of communication design could apply this in their classroom by asking their students to think about whatever. Um, so that very transparent move of I'm doing communication design, here's how my work helps you. Um, is important because it really helps our readers make that connection. Because if we're being honest, we're all very busy folks reading dozens of articles, writing dissertations, writing stuff. And it's nice to get that signpost that says, apply it this way. <laughs> because then I can focus in on it, or we can focus in on it and, and figure out where to go from there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Yeah. What else can we help you out on in terms of the sorts of articles? I mean, I can keep moving through prompts, but again, I just want to make sure I'm giving everybody a chance to ask. Yeah, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I was going to ask if you could speak a little bit about how COVID has, ch the challenges COVID has presented to publishing. Um, I'll speak for my own book reviews. Books have basically dried up. Um, the, they're, Publishers aren't sending them, and if they are sending them, they're caught in USPS wormholes. And um, sometimes I've had to send a, a few, um, they've just gone. Um, so I keep getting requests for reviews, but the books are, are just not coming in. So others maybe can speak to some of the challenges that you faced from, from COVID. Yeah, Laura? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question and topic. Um, I think what I'm seeing the most of right now is just um, 
because people are so stressed for time right now. I mean, people are changing their classes, maybe moving them online, maybe trying to teach their kids at home at the same time. Um, so we've got a little bit less of a pool of folks um, for reviews right now. And I think it's because they're just, they're just overtaxed. So I think we're seeing a little bit of lag there um, due to people's bandwidth. Yeah, we're, we're seeing the same thing. Yeah, I oh, would, go ahead. Well, I would agree too, both with Avery's observation and uh, uh, with the idea that we have these soft deadlines that, that I'm dealing with a lot just because everybody has, is dealing with COVID issues. And so I, I think that uh, if you want to take, take some of the scariness out of it, I think that that's a good place to say, well, you know, these deadlines that these editors, you know, specifically mine, uh, are, are there for marking a place and then renegotiation as far as I'm concerned uh, at this point in our world. Yeah, ab absolutely. The same thing's happening at, at CDQ. We've got an amazing editorial board. Uh, many folks in this room have reviewed for uh, CDQ. Um, and honestly, we've had folks that halfway through the review time have come back and said, I'm, I'm tapped. There's too much going on right now. I'm overwhelmed in ways I cannot even begin to articulate. And sure, I, I mean, we get that. I think part of what we ask as editors, it's funny, but in some ways we have to put it back on you. And that's, pl please be understanding with this if we have to turn around and say, I'm so sorry, we can't get this done in our usual 30 day turnaround. Our reviewers are just overwhelmed. And, or in some cases, I'm still trying to find a reviewer for one particular article because everybody I've written to ask, can you review it, has very graciously and kindly, but said, I, there's just no way right now. I, I'm, I'm tapped on it right now. So that's one way. Um, but Avery, I want to talk one other point. Something else has happened in, in terms of COVID in that um, folks want to write about it. Um, and that's cool and that's important. But I've also had some interesting conversations with folks that want to write about it now and get it published like this week. Um, and my advice for folks, so, some folks can, um, but my advice for a lot of folks is take the time to make sure that you're thinking about the, the situation critically and applying proper methods and theory to it and try not to be too angry when an editor says, maybe let's hold off on this article right now. We're still in the middle of it. You can't tell us what we learned by the end of the pandemic since, well, it depends on who you talk to, but many of us would agree it's still ongoing. <laughs> Um, so, honestly, being kind of critical about the way you approach the research practice as well. I don't know if Laura, I don't know if you guys have encountered that as well, but. You know, we haven't specifically yet. I mean, I think we're, we're planning on rolling that into um, an issue for next year, just thinking through COVID as one of the many um, crises that folks have been dealing with in terms of teaching and, and program administration. Um, so I think. I think we're seeing a little bit of lag in terms of people wanting to publish right this instant, but I understand, I certainly understand the, the impulse. Yeah. Other questions about the sorts of articles uh, that we will publish or consider? Uh, you talked about um, the, uh, an interest in pieces that have a very clear, concrete, uh, application. Uh, are you also looking for uh, pieces that uh, address methods or methodology? Is that something that is uh, of interest? Uh, if so, what what are the kinds of things that are you looking for? The results of those methods or discussion of those methods? What kinds of things are you would you be looking for in something like that? It, any and all of the above. So one of the things that I, I'll always ask anybody who submits to, to CDQ to think about is who's reading this thing, right? And probably our best exemplar of our readership population is everybody that's in this room right now. The, the, the largest body of folks who read Communication Design Quarterly are the folks that attend SIGDOC. And the folks that attend SIGDOC are you. Um, so if you've looked around at all of the presentations and the panels, we're all over the place. We have 
pure academics who do nothing but theory and think deep thoughts all day. We've got folks in the industry who know computer code inside and out and can make it do things that I cannot imagine. We've got statisticians. We've got students just beginning their careers. What that means to me as an editor is I, I'm really serious about that. If it applies to communication design, we'll consider it. But to go back to my earlier comment, it, I think some signposting is necessary though, right? So don't just turn in an article that talks about the work you're doing and then leaves it on me as an editor or the readers to try to figure out how to fit that into my world. Be really clear about it from the outset. This article is for practitioners in tech, technical communication working with data. Awesome. Now we have moved it specifically to that group. I know who to look for for reviewers. I know who it's going to hit with in terms of readership. Um, and that's something I consider. Or I'd like to propose a new method for working with something in communication design. This article, therefore, speaks to folks do it at the early stages of research. Again, that sort of signposting helps me as an editor and it helps you as readers figure out what to do with this stuff. Does that answer at all? Laura, uh, did you want to comment on? Sure. Um, we, I think our audience is less diverse than yours in that way. I mean, we're, we're pretty solidly talking with, to academics, but because of the nature of our programs, um, our work is, is intricately tied to uh, practitioners. Um, I would like to see collaborations between the people that are writing the articles between practitioners and academics. I think that could be a very interesting addition um, for our journal. Um, also to the methods issue, yes, totally. One of the things, one of our biggest struggles right now um, is defining the difference between a research article and a program showcase to authors um, and, and having them understand that the, the research articles are you know, a systematic research study, program showcases are more narrative in nature. So we're working on, on getting some clarity and, and guidance in those guidance documents. Um, but I think that conversations about how we do our research are, are really important. And I don't know that we do that as often as I would like to see it happen. So. So we would be very interested in, in conversations like that. I see a, a, a question in the, the chat I'd like to address. Um, and I'm sorry, I do not know how to pronounce your name. Could you please pronounce it for me so I say it correctly? Uh, yeah, sure. My name is Ye Ching. Ye Ching. Yeah. Excellent. That's a wonderful question. She asked, does CDQ publish tutorials or are there specific guidelines or sample articles for tutorials? We don't, we don't use the word tutorials. Uh, we use experience reports, but yeah, they're roughly the same thing. Um, so an experience report, uh, let me scroll up to our specific language. Reports representing project or workplace focused summaries of important technologies, techniques, methods, pedagogies, or project processes. So essentially, again, if you can make a case that this is something um, that our readers need to know how to do or uh, something that is unique in the field that specifically is going to help folks doing communication design or teaching communication design, then absolutely we are interested in doing it. Um, historically, we've had this on our roster for a long time, but not too many folks have submitted experience reports, in part, I think, because there's a weird, <laughs> a weird disconnect. Um, pure academics and historically standard academic publishing don't really know what to do with an experience report because it doesn't do things like, here are my methods as theorized through X, Y, and Z, and here's my literature review. Um, so one of the things that I've tried to do even just within the past year is clarify some of our review guidelines. And if somebody sends in something that says, please read this as an experience report, uh, I've got a special set of review guidelines that go out that say, when you're reviewing this, please don't come back and say, it's missing a 300 page literature review. We know <laughs> it's not there. This person works at Microsoft or something and therefore didn't do a literature review. So yes, to make that short, we were absolutely interested in that sort of work. Um, 
And if there's a question on how that looks, one of the best things you can do is reach out to us as editors specifically, and we're happy to look at abstracts, look at extended abstracts and help you shape that so that it would be a fit for audience. That helps a lot. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I'm trying to keep up with chat and questions. Yes, Lowell. Thank you. I'm um, sorry, I couldn't resist with a, with a room full of, of editors. I'm teaching a graduate, um, our graduate technical editing course. And I was wondering if I could get sort of the top skills um, or preparation that um, that you use on the job, the the things, the, either the skills that surprised you <clears throat> or the skills that are absolutely necessary above and beyond, you know, copy marking, track, to, you know, knowing those kinds of things, but the kind of management skills, maybe. Absolutely. Wonderful question. Who wants to start? I can start if you want. Okay. So, hi, Lowell. Hi. Uh, so I think some of the things that are coming up for me are definitely um, organizational in nature. Um, just how to handle the the workflow itself. You know, are you, we're in terms of the editor flow, in terms of tracking um, reviewers. So that whole organizational piece is something that I'd sort of thought about, but I didn't realize just what a role it was going to play. I also think that there's, um, I don't know what to call it. It's some sort of a just diplomacy that is needed. So you get, you send a paper out to two reviewers and you get somewhat different types of reviews and maybe you get one that's a little bit snarky. Um, how do you communicate back to the authors about that? How do you, how do you fulfill that role of communicating things in a, in a, um, constructive way. So I think that that is, I don't know what you call that skill. I'm going to call it diplomacy, but I think that that's real, really important one that, that we don't get taught when we're, we're talking through editing classes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I want to, I want to add to that. Uh, I'm going to follow directly up on the diplomacy thing. Um, the first word that came to mind for me was compassion. And then, um, and then the one that I don't know how to phrase, uh, recognizing that mistakes are gonna happen on my end as well. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that I have sent back reviews that and as I've gotten further down the road, I realized I shouldn't have sent that back that way. Um, also honesty, that's another one that comes up. So I'm thinking about what happens when we get reviews. So. I, I've told many of you this the story. You've probably even heard other editors roundtable. Um, I think the the paper that I am most proud of that's probably the center of my career um, that came out of my dissertation that led to my edited collection, all that stuff. I was rejected from three journals, um, and finally, uh, Chris Haas at Rena Communication said, "Look, man, <laughs> it's it's getting rejected because you're doing it wrong." You're, you're not using the right words here. You're not framing this correctly. It's going to work, but not the way you have it now. If you want to take the time, we can make this work. And we're going to need to go through the review process again and all of that. But we think we can make it happen. And there are times when you get a paper that just doesn't work, period. The methods don't fit with the results. The results don't match with whatever the the literature is just in some cases the the wrong literature for the argument um those are decisions that reviewers are eminently capable of, of, of picking up on most of the time but sometimes you get a paperback and you read the reviews and you're like no no <laughs> I, this, something else needs to happen here and and that's where that diplomacy compassion knowing when to ask for help uh happens. Um, I've learned that uh, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm sure Laura, Russell, and Avery can speak to as well is at first, it, it certainly, if you're an editor of a journal, it feels like you're very alone. 
the world gets very small and it seems like everybody's sending you stuff and you're supposed to make these decisions with only a couple of folks, but you're not. There are other editors, there's an editorial board, there are re reviewers that amazingly will respond to requests to have a meeting to clarify their responses. Um, and it's learning how to ask for the help to make the journal better. And I think that's the other part of it is something that you, you learn either by experience or by listening is that when you're an, an editor, you're, you're not in service to yourself, you're in service to the field and to the publication. And so that's a question that always has to, to come up. Um, I don't know if that answered your, your question from my end. Avery, Russell, you all wanna jump in on this? It does, it helps a lot, thanks. No, all right. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate it. So let me, I'm gonna make sure I'm hitting the points that I'm supposed to hit too. I'm keeping an eye on time here. Um, something I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks uh, are curious about, general submission requirements. Um, I think that's a good question to ask. It, it, too often they're put off as go see our, <laughs> go see our webpage which is a fair response, but uh, also, if you've got that as a question, that's something you should be asking editors about as well, because one thing at least I can speak for CDQ on is submission guidelines and submission requirements, if some journals are, we will not consider this unless you have done exactly X, Y, and Z. And for other journals there, and we want you to do these things, but we're flexible, so, for example, um, I think I already posted this link. Make sure I'm sending it. I keep sending stuff to like individuals. All right, I think that went to everyone. So for CDQ, if you submit to us, you need to have a hundred word abstract, three to five keywords, 6,800 words. And then there's the one inch margins, times near Roman, spacing, pagination, all that good stuff. Some of that we're a little flexible on. Things that we're not flexible on at CDQ anymore, um, and this is even changing over time. If you're submitting visuals, they need to have alt text um, because we're gonna have to do that anyway. Um, if you're citing things, please use a standard citation style. Uh, I'm not so much a stickler at CDQ. I prefer that you use the current APA version but what I'm most interested in is that you are consistent throughout and we can figure out when you have cited something appropriately or not, because things like that matter even at the reviewer level. Um, and a note on alt text too, I, I recently had this conversation with somebody. Some of these seem like, um, I've had some folks mention, it, it kind of seems like busy work at the submission stage, but I'd like you to consider something. If you send me a paper full of images, flowcharts, diagrams that are put in as images, equations put in as images, and there's no alt text. I now cannot send that paper to a reviewer who uses the screen reader, right? I have, I have now, you have now removed that person from my pool as somebody that could review this paper, which is why all of that is required for our submission guidelines. Um, so <laughs> I see some people have, it, it took a while to figure that out, honestly, and it took a way longer to, for me to figure that out than it should have, um, but we're there now. Uh, Laura, do you have anything on submission requirements and guidelines? Yeah, I think we're um, fairly flexible on our guidelines. We, we ask for, um, we use the APA style guide and we've got an in-house style sheet as well. Um, one of the main things we ask people to do is to um, take out any identifying information, uh, which would be institutions as well as authors. Um, other than that, it's pretty, pretty flexible. <laughs> yep. Um, I noticed a couple of questions in the chat. I want to hit those before they scroll past me again. Um, so, Manaka, you asked uh, about, you're, you're writing an article about how to accommodate mixed methods. Um, survey design, cognitive interviewing. Um, yeah, that feels to me like it's gonna be an experience report in the way that it's gonna be phrased because you would talk about, here's how I'm doing it and here's how you might apply this if I'm reading that correctly. Um, 
so that's my initial take on it. That's also something if you wanted to send an extended abstract, we can talk about which part of the journal it might fit most effectively in. Does that answer your question? I think, I hope. Um, and Jason, you asked a uh, typical turnaround time for review feedback. Um, Pre-COVID, I'd say 30 to 40 days and we try 30 days. In the midst of COVID land, we're still trying for 30 day turnaround. Um, and I'm really proud of us that mostly we do that. Um, but as we were talking about earlier, sometimes it's just not possible. Like right now I've got an article I've had for two weeks and it's finally out for review. And the reason it took that long is because everybody I asked to review it took a couple of days to respond and then said, I just can't, I'm so sorry. And that obviously adds to the clock. Um, and that's such as life. So we're still trying for 30 days turnaround. Um, if we're being really honest, it's probably more like 30 to 50 day turnaround. Uh, yeah, Laura? I think we're in the same boat. I mean, it would be ideal to do that 30 day turnaround, but that's just not happening right now. Um, so I would say it's more like, um, yeah, I'd say it's more like six weeks right now. I don't know in terms of the book reviews, if you guys have any thoughts on that. I'm a little behind right now, but I think I'm going to try to catch up here in the next couple of weeks, but then I'm, eternal, I'm an eternal optimist when it comes to all of that. I think we all are. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, I think that from my perspective, it's the same problem that people have on uh, who are submitting, that we, we just have other uh, uh, COVID-related issues getting in the way even of, of, our, of our own editorial work. Yeah, same. The... the the reviews when they actually when they come in it doesn't take me very long because they're short and um it doesn't take me very long to go through it but it's the the acquisitions of the books are taking much longer um much 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 longer and even just the request itself getting that request in is taking longer so mm. um that to slow things down but but the review itself doesn't take very long so Thank you, that's helpful. So that actually takes us nicely into the next prompt, which is, how does the book review publication process work? Y'all's turn. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so with, I guess I'll just go from start to finish. I usually wait until I have um, a collection of books and then I could, I plan it out for the next year. Um, so I don't go when I have a, like one at a time, just because it's like, as a book comes in, I wait till I have a good batch because it's just too time intensive um, to do that. And what I, well, what Derek and I and others have talked about this process because the way it, it's worked in the past has actually been, um, wait, I'll just say for myself, I just took over. I've only done this two, the first time I did it, I did, uh, first come, first serve, which is how I, I had seen it done in the past. But what happened was people who were on their computers all the time were grabbing the books. And I had said first come, first serve. And so I, I kind of, without realizing the process, gave them all away. And then you see, who, like it took, it was just like people who are already centered and already have access and already know how systems work were able to just grab all the books right away. And so, you know, I felt like that was a very unequal process for myself. And so I wanted to give people a chance who maybe aren't, you know, have other things going on in their lives or um, just kind of spread it out a little bit more and give other people opportunities um, to, to, to review a book and to get a book for free um, and to work with that, provide, get one of their first publications possibly. So um we i wanted to do something a little bit different and so we i devised this propo brief proposal system um uh, to give people an opportunity just to kind of say like what would you do with this review what positionality would you come from in your review and 
Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I did last time. And, and I just got floods, but I waited and waited and waited. I had a much longer window. And so what, what happened was professors who were hearing about a book review and then, you know, by the time the professor it takes days for the professor to even see it. And then they forward it to grad students that you know who could benefit from it. And then it takes a while for the grads, you know, so it takes, I needed a much longer window for, for the reviews. Uh, and so that's what's happened this last time. It's been much, much better. Um, so then I, we work with a deadline that works for you. I send the books out, um, media mail, it takes a while through USPS, but once you get the book, um, you'll write the review according to the guidelines. Basically I have two questions that we ask you to review, like summarize it and then evaluate it um, for different audiences, grounding it in your personal experience and expertise and positionality. Um, and then we just kind of go from there. You send it in according to the deadline and, and usually it just takes a couple days to, to go through it, do a couple revisions usually. And uh, once it's accepted, we, we send off the proofs. So it's usually how it's going, but we are trying to like really bring in, like I, I think I had a book on queer design that they're doing it from a queer perspective or they're do, it's a design but from a queer perspective. So we're looking for those kinds of things um, to, to, to bring in more social justice aspects to the readings when possible. So thanks. Russell, do you wanna talk about yours? A, a lot of what Avery just said is completely applicable here, including the first come first serve and then moving on into a more uh, well uh, considered uh, method of, of publishing. Uh, I, I think that uh, we're, that Laura and, and I are, are still kind of working through exactly how that should look. Uh, some of it has to do with the length of the particular volume um, and, and what, how that these one or two or three reviews per issue are going to uh, kind of inform the reading of, of the rest of it, whether it's a special issue or whether uh, it just is something that is uh, in the zeitgeist at the moment or whether it's something that's much more uh, aligned with the goals uh, of programmatic perspectives. And so uh, we, we kind of work at, in, in, the, in the background in, in trying to decide which of those should be foregrounded at the moment. Uh, and then of course, the other thing that, that, that uh, it's the same, I'm sure Avery has the same problem. You know, my list is always behind the publishing curve, even if it's slow, there are still volumes out there that I'd like to see, and so, or, or and, and ones that I haven't seen that that need to be recommended. And so, I'm probably going to be emailing Avery to, to look at, at that proposal system to see a little bit more about that, and 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 we can visit on it. But yes, it, it, much of the uh, the same uh, circumstances. Uh, by the way, I need to go and teach a face-to-face -face class, so. Uh, if you need anything, I'll put my contact information in the chat. Excellent. Thanks, Russell. So while we're still on the book review uh, process, though we lost Russell, Laura might be able to answer some questions on it. Do any of you specifically have questions on book reviews for our folks? Hey Derek, while they're thinking about that for a second, can I make a comment on a uh, message in the tech in the chat? Sure. Okay. Um, is it Kana Kana had talked about the publication of book reviews taking a while because they're a mentoring process, um, and that's very true. Um, but I also wanted to add that if folks are interested in the the editorial process, if you do like Derek, I'm not sure if you do something similar that as to what we do, but we do have the special issue editors. So that's a nice way to get some mentoring in the, the editorial process if you if you think you might be interested in that down the road. Yeah, um, I don't have that as one of the prompts, but that's probably something we should mention real quickly since you brought it up. Um, so I think many journals do special issues in different ways. You guys have special issues, uh, special issue editors. We have open calls for special issues. So maybe we can each talk a little bit about how that works. For, for CDQ, 
um, it's very much a mentoring process um, where you become editor of the journal and I become your support structure slash mentor in the process. So the way that works is if you wanna do a special issue, you write up a proposal and uh, a call for papers and you send that to me. I'll go over it with you and make sure that it's something that generally seems like it would be a fit for the journal, help you fix some of the language if that needs to be fixed. That then gets sent to our editorial board and our editorial board essentially asks, acts as a massive peer review panel and gives it either a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or a yeah, but we ask that you consider this along the way, um, which is usually how it works out. Um, we've actually run, since I've been editor, we've run two of them all the way through the process. Both were ultimately approved with minor revisions to what we asked the folks to consider for the special issue. And life being what it is, uh, both times the folks that were going to edit the special issues and put out the call for papers said life got in the way and I'm now too busy to do it. Um, so it stopped there. But hypothetically, <laughs> here's how it goes from there. You send in all of that stuff. We get it passed by the board. Not hypothetically. I Actually, the first thing I edited when I came in was a special issue that had already been accepted, but it had stopped there. So what we do then is we help you identify uh, reviewers uh, for the papers. You get the papers and you send those out for peer review. Um, just because you're doing a special issue doesn't mean that those papers are automatically in. They still have to go through peer review and can be rejected. So that's always something that folks have to remember. Um, the papers go through peer review. Of, then you, th you then, as special issue editor, pick from the papers that have been approved by your peer reviewers. Um, all or some, um, as happened in, in the, the last one I did, um, there were a whole bunch of papers and there were like seven that were great fits for a conversation and a couple that were great papers that did not ultimately fit with the special issue. And those ended up getting sent to me as individual submissions um, outside of the, the special issue. Um, once they're accepted, then you go through your, with, with my help, of course, you go through and you edit the papers uh, for everything from consistency to making sure the alt tech works to doing the layout on the thing. Um, we make sure all that is good. We send out proofs. You go through the whole proofing process um, and then we publish it. What, what all this means is that by the time you have done a special issue with CDQ, you can honestly tell people I have guest edited a journal and it wasn't just, I put out a call for papers. You now know the editorial process and have done it. For some folks, this will be too much work. I get that. For other folks, this is a wonderful way to get your feet wet and find out if editing is something that you are interested in doing. Um, and for other folks, it's a way to kind of test your editing skills and then you can apply those to edited collections and, and so on going forth. Uh, Laura, you want to talk about your process? Sorry, I had to find my unmute button. <laughs> so I'm, let's see, I came in as co-editor last October, so I have not gone through the special um, issue editing process yet, but our um, our workflow looks a lot like yours. Um, our, we try to make it so that the special issue editors have hands in the project for each step. Um, somebody from our end works closely in a mentoring sort of capacity. We have both generated special issue ideas and calls, or we've had people come to us and say, here, I'd like to do this as a special issue. Um, and then similar to you, if somebody comes to us with an idea, we take that to the, um, the executive committee, the editorial board, um, get an okay from them, and then, then we can move forward with it. Um, not having done it yet, I think that's about all I can share right now. We're hoping to do it next year. Actually, I, I want to comment on that. So the, I'm glad you said that, Laura. I started off by saying, that um, editors are often mythologized. And there's also, I have to admit, when I read some of the Twitter stuff, especially in, in other fields, I get a little sad and sometimes angry because folks often seem very upset at the peer review process and editors about how things 
work. And in some cases, I think that's really warranted. But a lot of that, I think, just comes from not understanding that editors are, are people too. Um, and I think what you just pointed out is, is really good. Look, if we're being honest, uh, Laura's brand new as the journal editor, so she's still working on this process. I've been doing this for a couple of years, but like I said, I haven't actually run a special issue all the way through from proposal to publication. And those are the editors in your field and, and now I've been doing this for a few years. All of that to say, if, if you're uncertain of how this whole publication thing works or you, you don't know if this is the right thing to propose to this journal or if you will want to get into this, just, just send an email and we'll have a conversation and we'll work it out because that's ultimately, that's <laughs> to, get, to go back to Lowell's question earlier, that is how I've learned so much about editing is just having conversations with folks. And if I don't know, somebody on my board does. And if somebody on my board doesn't, uh, I have unashamedly sent emails to just about every editor in our field and sometimes on group text saying, how would y'all handle this? Um, so yeah, I, I thought that was a great transition to, to, to use there. Do y'all have any questions on special issues, proposals, ideas, anything we can answer before I move on to the next point? Groovy. Don't, don't hesitate to email or put questions up there. Um, so another key question that I'm supposed to address here is how does the peer review process work? I think that's an important one, again, because this shouldn't be a black box. Um, so maybe I'll give the bare bones for CDQ. Lori, Avery, y'all can talk about it as, as it works for you too. Here's, here's the short version of how this works. You have written an article, it is amazing, you want to get it off your desk, you want to see it out in the world. Uh, you send it uh, to an editor. It is always useful to send it to the editor along with a brief paragraph or so saying, dear so-and-so, please consider the following for submission, and a paragraph or an abstract that tells me what it is. Even better, though we don't have this in our requirements, you give me a paragraph or an abstract saying what it is and here are a few people that might be a good fit for reviewing. That's useful for, for me because though I have an editorial board, sometimes I'm getting stuff and I look at it, I'm like, I don't know who does that work off the top of my head. Um, so immediately from the moment I get your email, I'm trying to figure out who is most qualified to fairly, honestly, and objectively read your paper and give feedback on it. That will be valuable. All right. So I get your paper, um, you get a response from me saying, dear so-and-so, thank you for your submission. Your paper is now being given full consideration for publication. I then go to my database because I don't use an automated system. I go to my database and I assign your paper a number. Um, and then the next thing I do if I have time that day is I open it up and I make sure that it's fully anonymized, including stripping the information off the metadata. Awesome. I then go through and I read your paper um, from top to bottom couple things can happen at this point. I can read your paper and say, as much as I love this topic, it's not a fit for my journal. It's just, there's nothing I can do to work with you to make this paper a fit for my journal because it's not a fit for my journal. Um, and at that point, if that happens, you'll get a response from me that what, which is called a desk reject saying, I'm, I'm sorry, even though I as, as has happened, even though I honestly enjoyed every minute of reading this paper, it's not something I can publish here. Um, I recommend you try someplace else. Um, and at least on my end, I try to give you direction. So if I read a paper and it's a better fit for CPTSC or written communication, I'll say, try, try submitting it to these folks. Even better, send them an abstract first and see if they might be interested. If, however, I read it and I say, I can see this in the journal, and this is important, even if I read it and I'm like, ooh, yeah, I, mm, part of that is not working for me. But maybe, then I figure out who reviews. So I've got 48 members on my editorial review board in my database. I have a list of their general expertise. That's always where I start. Unless I'm reading something and I'm like, ooh, Avery just published a paper on this last week. 
yeah, perfect reviewer for this paper or something like that, right? So I go both from my board and from institutional memory who does what work. Um, and I try to find a couple of good reviewers. At CDQ, it goes out to two reviewers. Um, if there's a tie or a split, I'm the, I'm the mediator unless I feel I cannot serve in that position. And as has happened a couple of times, I'll send it out for a, a third opinion. That adds time to the review process, but it has happened. Um, if both reviewers come back and they're like, this is awesome, publish it as is, then I'll go through it and make sure that it really is published as is. And usually we do some edits and off we go. Um, let's be honest, that's rare. More than likely what's going to happen is your paper will come back with um, a revised resubmit, which is generally along the lines of, this is great, it seems like a fit, or I could see it being a fit, but we've got to do some work. Or you went from point A to point D, and I'm going to need B and C along the way. Um, and so we send back the reviewer reports along with um, a contextualizing letter saying this is what you're going to need to do. That goes back to you. You work on it. The paper comes back to me. I then ask those same reviewers if they are willing to review the paper again. So you guys can already see where time starts stacking here, right? And this is where all your time goes in the review process. The paper comes back to me. I write the reviewers again. I say, would you be willing to review this paper? They say, most often, sure. The paper then goes out to them again. They now have another 30-day window to review it. If they accept it at that point, then we move on to the final editing process, layout, proofing, setting up the web text, checking all your alt text and all of that, and finally publication. So if you're wondering why sometimes it takes a really long time to get a paper from I submitted it to publication, Nine months would be if everybody responded to their email like the day I sent it, probably. And if when you got it back for review, you're like, awesome, I don't have anything going on for the next month, I can just write now. <laughs> um, and then of course, the third thing that can happen when I send it out to reviewers is both reviewers come back and they say, look, it's just, it's, it's not, in my view, this paper is not solvable right now. It either needs more work or it's not formed or it's just never going to be a fit regardless of how good the writing might be. We, we can't see a, a path forward for it, in which case you'd get a reject. Um, I'd add, before I turn this over, I want to add one quick note. Again, a common myth. If, a, if an editor says, I reject your paper, please never read that as, I dislike you as a human being. Um, I've seen that way too many times and I've on Twitter, again, that's one of the things that makes me angry. Just because an editor says this is not a fit at this time or I, I, ha I regret that I have to reject your paper, it doesn't mean I never want to see anything from you again or I think that your scholarship is terrible. It means this current paper as it stands now is not a fit for my publication. And when I say things after that like, please do not hesitate to contact me with questions and I look forward to seeing your scholarship in the future, I mean it. You can turn around and send me a new paper you've been working on the next day and it will go through that same process as openly as and objectively as that first one did. So that's the general overview from my end and I'll shut up. Dan is wishing that he could mute me again right now. Um, Laura. <laughs> Dang, Eric, I'm just going to say ditto. <laughs> you do such a nice job. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we go through a similar process. Um, for, well, when you send an article to us, um, either Leanne or myself will read through that article um, to decide if it's a good fit. And again, if it is um, considered a desk reject, it's all, it's 99% of the time, at least, it's because it just isn't a right fit for the journal. Um, then um, if we decided to send it out to peer review, it goes to two reviewers. And um, we've got a, a spreadsheet of reviewers that we go to um, that we update annually, just making sure people still want to review for the journal and updating expertise areas because sometimes people's interests change and they might be working on something different than the last time you talked to them. So we'll try to find the right expertise fit there. Um, we'll also, luck, we're lucky to have each other's co-editors so we can bounce ideas back and forth and kind of say, well, not sure about anybody. How about 
do you have anybody in mind for a review for this article? Um, and we also have um, CPTSC's exec executive committee, um, which is they're staunch supporters of the journal and they are, they're our backup people too. So we can ask, go to them and ask them if they've got some folks in mind. Um, so then we'll send the, uh, the request out to the reviewers that we identify. And I would say as well, um, an abstract with the article is an excellent idea because that's what I want to put at the bottom of my email when I request, you know, ask them if they're going to review. Then I can give them that little snippet of what the article is as well as the title of it. Um, and that's so helpful to me to be able to just pull that out and copy and paste it. Um, so we'll do that and hopefully get the turnaround um, in within the 30 days. And then we have um, specific guidelines for our articles. We ask a series of questions for the reviewers to answer. And then they make a decision about, um, we have decisions of accept, accept with revisions, revise and, re revise and resubmit or reject. Um, and most of our articles are come in as revise and resubmit. Um, we see it as a we see this process as as a, a process of development. Um, so we tend to to want to work with the authors on the ideas that they're presenting and to make it the strongest article that that we can. Um, so we tend that very first round, if it's a fit, if it's a good fit, it might need some extra work but we'll do a revise and resubmit. Um, so that'll go back to the authors. Then the authors will do their, we try to get a sense of time frame from them. Um, when they send their revisions back, they always have a nice outline um, letter telling us what they did if they decided not to do something for a particular reason. Um, hopefully they've outlined why that, that rationale is. Um, and then let's see. So they get that back. And then I try to send it, we try to send it back to the original reviewers. Um, it doesn't, ideally that's what happens on occasion, it doesn't. Um, so if it doesn't, we try to find somebody else that is willing to, to look at the revision and we'll send the, the original comments back to that person. Um, and at that point, um, it, it's usually, well, sometimes we, have, we go through another round with people, but usually we're in a space where we can go to the copy edit mode. Um, so we'll do the, we'll go through the copy edit mode with the authors. Um, and each time this little window of time gets smaller. So when we, when we send the copy edits to the authors for any uh, clarification and make sure everything's okay with them, um, that will be a shorter win turn turnaround time. And then once we get into layout, um, we'll do a page proof round with the author. Um, I pretty much, I think that sums it up for us. Cool. Um, Avery, you want to talk a little bit about the review process for book reviews? That's very different. Yeah, it's very different. Um, so we, I, I uh, use, I have published book review guidelines, um, and I'll put those in the chat. Um, but it really kind of uh, delineates exactly how we want book reviews to be sent in in terms of formatting, um, word length. And then the two real primary work that a book review should do, which is summarize and analyze um, along with the audiences. Um, so um, that's the first thing that I do is kind of look through how are you following our formatting guidelines and have you done those two things for our audiences. Um, and, um, you know, I really kind of go and then I the typical kind of editorial stuff um, and you'll get that pretty back pretty quick and then we just kind of go from there. Usually it's just like one or two rounds of revisions. Um, editing a collection and edited, uh, reviewing an edited collection can be a challenge, uh, but I've been really excited to see how different authors have or different reviewers have dealt with that. So it doesn't turn into just like listy, um, you know, being more synthesizing instead of listing, you know, really what the book review is looking for is, is this book worth a reader's time? That's what readers are looking for. Should I invest the time, my limited time into this book? Uh, is this something I should consider for my research? Um, and it helps authors to kind of promote their work. So um, you're kind of balancing all those different things. Um, and, you know, that's, that's generally the way it goes. And what, what is, you know, I'm looking for something along the lines of, 
community, uh, the design, the communication design and technical communication. So I don't really want textbooks. Um, that's not really a good place to use for this, for this format, but um, I've considered lots of different books um, for more critical theory philosophy perspectives to really practical perspectives. Uh, so I'm always able, willing to entertain books. The only issue, like I've mentioned before, is getting those books right now has been a challenge. But if you already have the book and you're, or you can get it from a library and you're willing to wait a little while for a publisher to come through, then you know I'm happy to entertain all kinds of requests. Excellent, thank you. So another great place to pause for, for questions. What, what questions do you have for us about the peer review process or helping to demystify this for you. Again, I think our whole point in all of this is we don't want you to be terrified to submit or scared of editors by the time we're done with all this. So what can we help you out with? I have a question. Please, Josie. Um, so I, I welcome <clears throat> this demystifying process because I think that um, I know that you 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 have said stated that your intention is not to sort of like um, Sam Drager put it the other the other way it's we are, we are not gatekeepers we are gardeners and I I just wish that all editor editors would have sort of that ethos not because um, not not so much because they want to publish every substandard piece of work, but because they want to nurture what I think would be the future, you know, scholars and researchers in the field. Um, but back to sort of your process of um, <clears throat> um, assessing whether or not um, a submission is a good fit. Um, did I hear you say that you could have somebody get an R&R &R and then have it rejected after they've done that again it, yeah. it can happen yeah um okay i <laughs> this is honestly one of the parts where we were talking earlier we were talking about the ideas of uh, when lowell asked us about what what we what we learned about editing diplomacy compassion knowing when to ask for help recognizing mistakes happen those were all things but also part of that is um trusting reviewers when their comments are definitive. Um, so what I mean by that is it, it has happened that we've had an article go out and it comes back and one reviewer says, I think it's an accept and the other one says, I think it's a reject, but I'm gonna go with revise, resubmit and you get a revise, resubmit. You then follow that process, you revise your paper and we send it back out to the reviewers. And it has happened that in some cases, the reviewers have come back and the one who has accepted before said, wow, um, no, uh, after all of this work for me, that's a reject. And the other reviewer says, yeah, unfortunately, this is not an improved paper. In fact, now it's even more confusing than it was before. This is a reject. And there's a point there where as an editor, um, I think mercy comes into play as well, because what we could do is we could send it out for revise and resubmit again. And also think about time, right? So now I'm asking reviewers to read the same piece two times, maybe three times. They could come back and say reject, reject again. Um, and, and there's a, a point of diminishing returns. If somebody goes through the process and the paper has dramatically decreased in its fit for the journal, typically what will happen is we'll say, I'm, I'm so sorry, but it's, it's going to be a reject now. Or, as has also happened, um, in at least one case, uh, we had the paper go out and it came back, revise, resubmit, and the author did work and it came back and one author said, I sure accept. And the other author said, uh, the other reviewer said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is in no way should this be published. 
and in going through the comments, trying to be the best editor I could, the best I could say was, I'm going to give you the opportunity to revise, resubmit it again. And the author's like, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I'm going to take this work <laughs> elsewhere. And I think that's fair. I honestly do. I think that's a fair response, right? So yeah, it's a long answer to, to your question, but it, it does happen that reject happens after revise, resubmit. It's less common, but certainly a thing that, that occurs. Uh, Laura? Yeah, it's, it doesn't happen often, but, um, you know, I could see somebody going down the rabbit hole the wrong way. Um, and so I think at that point, um, when you were talking about what we were, in our answer to Lowell's question, I guess it's like, it comes down to um, judgment calls too. It's like, is it, does it make sense to keep pursuing this piece um, or not? And I think that ultimately you'd have to make that judgment call in terms of, is it, is it going to be a worthwhile article for the for the audiences? Is it um, strong enough for the journal? And weigh that against um, what Derek was talking about with everybody's time and trying to get this get get a piece like that out. Um, luckily, like you said, it doesn't happen all that often. <laughs> we have had people walk okay. away though. If, if the revise and resubmit becomes too extensive, they we've had a couple people walk away and say, "No, we're going to just try it as is somewhere else." I don't know how that goes. Yeah, just just on that note too. There's there's also, I, again, in, in the interest of demystifying the process, please please be aware of all of you too. Editors get invested in your work too, and it sometimes it's difficult to let a piece go, right? So it may be revise, resubmit, revise, resubmit. And at this point, I'm like, we are going to get this working, and it might be in your best interest as an author to say, uh, or. Oh, or I could submit it to TCQ because I want to work with Dr. Walton and we're done here. Thanks so much for your time. Um, and I think that's part, part of what we're, we're talking about here, right? You shouldn't ever view your editors as sort of a, a brick wall stop. They're people to have conversations with. Um, I've had some really productive conversations with folks where the conversation was, where should I go with this? <clears throat> and if my answer is, I'm, I'm not sure how to make this fit now, then that's a sign that maybe we're in the wrong place. Um, Josie, I've gone on as I usually do. Did that answer your question at all? Yeah. Thank you. Um, other questions from folks about the yes, review process? Um, um, to, yes, two directions. I, I would say, I mean, you, you, you advised us against um, bitching about reviewers, <laughs> which I've never done on Twitter, but I definitely do in my shower. Um, because it's, I think it's just human, it's natural. Like you feel, you feel rejected as you, know, you associate your work with yourself until you feel rejected. But, uh, and then if you're like me, I, like I usually do that, I freak out and then I go back and look at the comments and I rework it. And, and I have to say that most times, a hundred percent like the, the the resulting work becomes better like i can see that yes definitely these were blind sides that i hadn't thought about and i'm glad that the reviewer pointed them out so so i just wanted to put that there but then you did also suggest that we that somebody could su submit a project and then recommend reviewers and i wondered what that does for the blind review process Oh, oh um, uh, let me make sure I have your question right. So, so if somebody recommends reviewers to me? Yes, like if I submitted something and then I say, you know who might be a good reviewer for this? Is um, Aiden, is Kenna, is, is Daniel. And then, and then how do I claim that that was a blind review? If, if in fact you do go with those reviewers? Well, that's, I think that's the important bit here. You, you don't know if I've gone with those reviewers. Um, okay. In, in fact, most of the times, <laughs> if I'm being honest, most of the times when people have suggested a reviewer to me, uh, I go, especially if I'm not familiar with that person's work, I go look at where that person is publishing and find somebody who's doing the same or similar work that they are and go with them. Maybe I've submitted to one of those, maybe I've used one of those folks if you gave me a list of four and I asked them to be a reviewer, I won't tell you. Um, but more often than not, if 
I'll use those as a heuristic for me to figure out where I should be going next. And again, like we, we mentioned earlier, I mean, I've got a pretty massive editorial board I draw from, and that's, that's always my first stop. If I can, I always want at least one person on my editorial board as a reviewer uh, for the paper. It doesn't always work out that way, but I try. Um, and then, like you said, if you've suggested somebody, really the, the most valuable thing that does for me is that it puts me in the right ballpark of where to start looking for potential reviewers. Uh, Laura? Yeah, we don't, um, I don't ask for potential reviewers from authors. Um, we go with our reviewer pool and our editorial board and our executive committee for those names. Yeah, I, I should be clear. That's not anywhere in our, uh, in our requirements for submission. I've just had folks um, do that. And sometimes, especially if somebody sends me an abstract, um, for example, I don't do data. I don't do coding. There's a lot of statistical stuff I don't do. Um, right. And if somebody sub right. submits to me an abstract on stuff like that, I'll be like, sure, it looks like a, a fit. Could you give me some idea of who might be a good reviewer for a piece like this? And that yeah. just lets me start start my research process. Yeah. No, I've heard I've heard that. I think even Kirk Cinema once said that that's something one could do, and then maybe that gives the editor some idea of. But like you said, maybe they look at where the person has published and who they've published with, and then they find somebody who's a fit. Thank you. Both. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, we have 12 minutes uh, left. So I want to come back to this, but I want to make sure that I fit all of the key questions that as moderator I agreed to hit. Um, so the next one was, how do you suggest interested authors go about revising their presentations for submissions? I'm, I'm glad I got to that one. Please do. Um, if you have put the time and effort into a short paper uh, for this conference and a presentation, please take the time and consider turning it into a full paper. And most of the time, I, I, I hate to use the word, use, it's as easy as filling in the blanks that you wish you'd had the time to do for the presentation. Um, sometimes that means extending the literature review. Sometimes that means working more on what you learned from the methods. In almost all cases, it means taking everything that took one paragraph for this paper and turning it into six paragraphs or something like that. Um, start with, I mean, <laughs> I, I can't help it. I've now been teaching for a, a very long time. Um, start with putting all of your headings in order, introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusion, if that's the method you're going with or something. And my process is always, I wish I'd talked more about, like I'm working on a paper, I, I'm working on a book right now, but I'm also working on some other papers. Family in Earth First, that might become a heading. I'm like I didn't even get to talk about that in my presentation, I wish I had. And now I know that I should fill in the blanks there. Um, the other version just beyond going through and doing some mapping is honestly, send your abstract to the editor of the publication that you want to see the thing in and ask them quite frankly, here's what I presented. What would make this a better fit for your journal? What would readers most be interested in from this presentation? Because I've been to at this point, I think I've been to probably half of the presentations um, at, uh, at SIGDOC right now. And from everyone I've been to, I see probably three potential trajectories that you could spend time and energy on, one of which is going to be a best fit for the readers of CDQ, one of which might be a best fit for the readers of TCQ, one of which might be a best fit for the readers of CPTSC. How you dedicate your time is now going to drive that project. So reach out. Uh, Laura? Yeah, I would use the, the presentation as kind of an outline. And I actually think it's, um, it's a great, it's a great way to go about getting to, to a paper for a publication because a lot of times when I've seen submissions, what will happen is it's just that it's like, it's actually three papers in one. So maybe you have less of a chance of that happening if you start from the, the bare bones. <laughs> um, so I think using that as an outline and again, reaching out, because I know in 
pre-COVID, um, editors would, you know, go into the rooms and see the presentations and chat with you afterwards sometimes and say, hey, I think this could be a really good fit for the journal. Um, and that happens less now. So that means that you all need to, to step up and, and contact us and not be afraid to do that because I find it very refreshing and wonderful when somebody actually says, hey, I want to publish something in your journal. It's like, yay. Yeah, I, such such a valuable piece of advice there. Again, I, I, we've now come back to this so many times. The editorial process is a conversation. Um, sometimes you just need to start the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm trying uh, to, there are some papers that just to me read as obvious fits for CDQ. When I go to those presentations or watch those presentations, I'm trying to remember to the minute I finish the presentation, I send an email, hey, I like your presentation. If you want to talk about <laughs> publishing this, shoot me a line. I'm trying to do that, but sometimes I've got other stuff. I'm also director of graduate studies and a graduate student has a crisis right now and all of a sudden I forgot to send that email and then it'll be next week and time has moved on. So just reach out to us, please. Um, what other questions can we answer for you on that? And that's a wonderful one to pause on. You're, just about everybody here is writing and publishing presentations right now. What, what can we help you out with and turning those into article length stuff? And I see there's a question from Avery. Can we turn our proceedings into a manuscript to submit to CDQ as well? Avery, didn't you do that? Not yet, but I'm thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> the the oh, reason I ask is yeah. when I first met Avery it was two years ago, we had a conversation about ongoing work that immediately turned into a publication in CDQ that mm -hmm. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put Avery up here is probably one of our most popular publications in CDQ. And that came out of some hallway conversations standing around in front of posters is how that that evolved so yeah. yes <laughs> you can turn the stuff that you're even talking about with at conferences into publications it was a presentation you're right i totally forgot <laughs> <laughs> yeah what other questions can we answer for y'all All right, last prompt then. And if there is stuff that we haven't gotten to, again, shoot us an email. Our last prompt, what do you wish new authors knew about the submission and review process? Uh, Avery, let's start with you. Oh. Um. Um, I guess the, the, the big, you know, thing that I, I think is some of the most successful reviews are the ones that for book reviews ground it in your personal experience. Um, Kana's review is an excellent example of that. Um, it's, uh, it was you, how she used the review or used the book in practice and it, it was fantastic. And so I think um, it, it, you yeah using using your personal experience using your expertise personal voice um personal tone has i think makes really successful reviews and i think that's something a lot of people don't they kind of take a lot of times like a real more academic -y kind of language to a book review and that's great i think I've, I've, I've got some successful ones but ones that really draw people in are the ones that that make it really personal to them and i think that that's been that's something I'd love to see more of. Laura, your best advice for authors, the submission and review process and what you wish they knew. Right. Um, well, some of it we've been saying all along, um, reach out to the editor. It's never a bad idea. Um, realize that, especially in our world now, things are, take a little time with the review process. Um, 
be uh, ultra aware of telling me what you're submitting. Um, sometimes we'll ha there's this fuzzy boundary between our research articles and our program showcases. Um, make sure that I know what category you're submitting in and we'll make sure that it, that it finds the right fit. But I need to, to know from your perspective what you think, what you think the article is. Yeah, just to echo, echo that, I mean, I am born and bred technical professional communicator. Come on, I came out of Texas Tech. Thanks, Joyce. Um, <laughs> right, and like half the people in here, sorry. Um, look, audience, purpose, and context. Know your audience, know what you want to accomplish, know where you're publishing and who's reading it. And if, and if you don't know all of those things from the get-go, that's when you reach out and you say, hey, uh, Derek, I'm interested in submitting to CDQ, but I, I'm really not sure who's going to be reading this. How, how do I need to be framing it? What should I be focusing on here? Um, and that's where we can help you. And that's, I think, our, our, our last bit too, which I, I hope we've made abundantly clear. Please, please don't be scared to send an email. Don't be scared to ask for a Zoom meeting. Um, I've, <laughs> I've had conversations on my front porch with my dogs barking in the background over cell phones with people about their work. Um, that's what we're here for. We're ultimately here to help develop the work because as we've talked about, um, we're not here to support ourselves as editors. I'm not doing this to make me a better person. I'm doing this because I I believe in my organization and my journal and the field, and we're trying to grow the field. And that's what we're, all of us are, are working together to try to do. And I think increasingly that's where it's wonderful to have conversations like this because you can say, I want to do this. And I'm like, mm, not a fit, send it to Laura, send it to Rebecca. Why don't you try this person first or if you want to publish it with me let's let's try here because we're, I think I think it's fair to say we're all trying to do the same thing here uh, two minutes last thoughts from the panel last questions from folks Derek thanks for hosting this it's great it's yeah, thank you all for participating. This has been wonderful. Uh, it is, it is, I probably talk too much. I usually do, but it's, it's so good to get to talk with everybody here. And thank you all for your wonderful questions and for participating. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. See y'all around thank the conference. You. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. Andrew. Bye. Bye. Hey, nice to see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you for agreeing. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Derek. Thanks. Hey, Dan, quick question. Did, uh, is the chat captured somewhere? Um, yes. But cool. yes, it is. Uh, Chris, Chris, uh, Chris has access to it as well. Um, but yes, I just saved it. Perfect. I, I, I'm positive I saw a few questions come by that I did not get a chance to answer. So, okay. and Josie, thanks for those wonderful questions. Oh, well, thank you for providing the sort of the atmosphere to ask them. Cool. <laughs> so I think my biggest fear, my biggest problem was I was always so afraid of submitting anything because I, I thought they would just tear me apart and I couldn't handle it. The, the first okay. paper I ever submitted, first, first ever paper I submitted, mm -hmm. came back with a review that said, and I quote, because it's seared on my soul, this is about <laughs> as empirical as a Bible study group. You shouldn't be publishing or writing in this field. <laughs> and uh, I knew then and there that I needed to develop a thicker skin. <laughs> Thicker skin is right. <laughs> I love that you call it Chris Haas editorial story though, because I feel like that was my introduction to like the reality of someone telling you what you need to do in the same way. And I had the same experience. I love, I feel like I learned many things from my um, 
process of working with written communication. So. Oh man. <laughs> An written communication, Stacy. Mm -hmm. they can make yeah, I'm on their break. editorial board now, but I mean, when I first, the first time I sent something there and got it back from Chris Haas, I was just like, whoa. <laughs> 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 she has a way, for sure. And boy, I mean, when you, you see the difference between some editors, I know most of y'all have been around the field long enough to get the difference, to get something back from an editor that says, uh, I'm sorry, this isn't something we would ever consider. Please see the reviews. And then the reviews are like, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> exactly. Versus somebody like Chris Haas, who writes yeah. you four pages of notes, yeah. contextualizing what you're reading. And th that that can literally shape careers. It's it can. <laughs> it can break your career, right? <laughs> My first year on the tenure track, I think, I submitted to BC Business Communication Quarterly. And I never heard back like for like eight months. And then after eight months, I got an email saying uh, the editor quit suddenly. And so please bear with us and we're just going to get a new editor and we'll get back to you. Uh -huh. And then another four months went by. Mm -hmm. And then I got a split decision. Yes, no. And the, the, the then editor, I guess, said, well, no. <laughs> like, yep. okay, 12 months. Like, this is what you, you, you know, I felt like they, they had an obligation for having had me wait so long and then, and then get us, one was a clear yes, and the other one was just a clear no, it was just split. And I was like, what's your role as editor? Like, what, what did you just go with the no? Because there was no context, nothing. Right. So there was that. <laughs> I've had, I've had, and sometimes editors are just, I don't know, maybe they're having a bad day. Um, I've had one that was reviewer one, blah, blah, blah. I look forward to seeing the revision of this. This will make a great piece. Reviewer two, this, this is going to be a really valuable contribution to the field. I look forward to seeing the revision of this. Editor, as you can yeah. see, this is a strong <laughs> reject. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tick that one off my list of people to ever submit to again, <laughs> moving on. Exactly, exactly. And, and I mean, you said lately, like I have developed the courage to write to editors and say, listen, I have revised this twice now and I don't know if I will satisfy your viewer X. I did that with Sam Draga, for example. And he, and he, you know, it was just out of, I was like, if he says, how dare you email me, I'll just, at that point, I was like, I just take it elsewhere because I can't do this anymore. But yeah. he was very accommodating. He was like, no, 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 no. Let's see um, if we can bring this reviewer into agreement because I think they're, they're asking a lot of you, but they're also um, pointing out things that, that would make the paper stronger. Yeah. But some of the things that this reviewer was saying were like, you were, this, this writer is just trying to gain sympathy for this cause. I'm like what? <laughs> Should we turn off recording? That? What? Oh, Should we turn off recording. Yeah, yeah. Daniel. Oh, it's still recording. Well, delete that bit. At least we 